You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Do you want to know what it's like to hang out with MS-13 in El Salvador? How the Russian mafia fought battles all over Brooklyn in the 1990s? What about that time I got lost in the Burmese jungle hunting the world's biggest meth lab? I'm Sean Williams. And I'm Danny Gold. And we're the hosts of the Underworld Podcast. We're journalists that have traveled all over, reporting on dangerous people and places. And every week, we'll be bringing you a new story about organized crime from all over the world. Available wherever you get your podcasts. There's a story that Franklin Roosevelt was talking with one of his older New York State political operators, Lewis Howe, a guy who had come from the rumble and tumble of New York City politics, and Franklin from New Hyde Park and a wealthy aristocratic family. And Howe said to Roosevelt, you've got to relate to the working man. And Franklin said, I do. I am a member of the Democratic Party. That's the party of the common man. And Howe said, what have you got in common with the common man? And Franklin Roosevelt raised his glass to his lips and took a sip. Drinking is not an ancillary subject when discussing Franklin Roosevelt, because had it not been for the Great Depression and certainly not for World War II as well, you might remember Franklin Roosevelt as the president who ended prohibition. That was his major campaign issue in 1933. In fact, so many of the New Deal programs that we talked about, we talk about all the time, were not part of the 1933 platform. And although some were proposed, certainly like a kind of a work program was proposed at different times, there was equal amount of talking on the 1932 campaign about conserving money in the budget as well and, and, and how Hoover was spending too much. The issue that was stark between Roosevelt and Hoover was that Roosevelt wanted to bring a repeal to prohibition. That being said, uh, Franklin Roosevelt was something of uh, what was called a, a wet but not a soaking wet by his friends, particularly in Georgia, where given that was the president's uh, summer home, he had some friends there. And when he started to run for president, you know, he found Georgia to be very receptive to his message because he had connections there and he had worked that state's politics pretty well and he was obviously a big investor in that state. That state was dry, so he had to develop a policy that was in between. And one of the things that is not well known about the 21st is that the 21st doesn't just give you the right to have a beer. It gives regulation of liquor, takes it away from the federal government and gives it to the states so that those states that are dry can enforce, and the federal government and Congress can make no law infringing on the ability of states to regulate liquor. So he was something of a a wet, but not a soaking wet, separating his presidency from personal life. Franklin Roosevelt was an avid fan of drinking, and he was, by most accounts, and one of these people who would every day when business was done in the White House, something they called the the children's hour <laughs> or uh, or a variety of other names. And the president was certainly the mixologist in chief. And so we discussed a bit about that in the episode about the 1944 vice presidential nomination and how a meeting over martinis uh, determined perhaps – the fate of the presidency. But those type of meetings were not uncommon at all. And usually, Roosevelt was the bartender. He experimented with um, a variety of drinks. Um, One of the drinks was called the Haitian libation. And it it was difficult to say, you know, what was in it. (laughs) But uh, it certainly involved rum and sugar and various uh, other spirits. (laughs) 
Roosevelt, as we kind of alluded to on that cast, had his favorite presidential cocktail shaker, and it was um, had a motif of bamboo, but it was silver, sterling silver, and it had a case that was maroon leather, and on the inside, blue velvet. Now, this was something that traveled around with the president. <laughs> But Franklin Roosevelt's drink was the martini. And there's a lot of different stories about his martinis, but they all seem to have this consensus. He would constantly change the recipe up. And the idea behind a martini is that it's simply, you know, a gin drink. I know these days it's it's all about vodka. That wouldn't have been touched in those days in a martini. They would have had vodka and other things, but not in a martini. And uh, so it's mostly gin with a small amount of vermouth. Uh, Roosevelt's martinis, you would up the vermouth and and shake it, shake it briskly, which in effect you're making a uh, a weak martini that way. You know, sh- Roosevelt was, years before James Bond, a shaken, not stirred guy. Here's what Samuel Roseman said in a 1952 book, Working with Roosevelt. The president, without bothering to measure, would add one ingredient after another, to his cocktails. To my unpracticed eye, he seemed to experiment on each occasion with a different percentage of vermouth, gin, and fruit juice. At times, he varied it with rum, especially rum from the Virgin Islands. One of his infamous concoctions, we referenced this on the last podcast, was mixing gin with the herbal liquor Benedictine. Benedictine is a very rarely used liquor. Uh, It's kind of one of these things where it was a a recipe found by ancient monks in the 1300s, and uh, it was recreated uh, in the 19th century. And it's one of those things, a little bit of it might taste okay, too much of it, and you're talking about something with the flavor of rusty nails. There's different accounts. Robert H. Jackson, who was a key Roosevelt aide and then actually later became a Supreme Court justice, participated in many of these you know, cocktail hours with the president. And he did say, you know, that, that Roosevelt liked, you know, one or two and maybe another after dinner or another while playing cards, um, but that he did not tolerate a drunkenness uh, from anyone that, that worked for him and that... um you know, he had his limit and then he was cut off. That could be a little whitewash because we have some other stories as well. Stories of perhaps Secret Service agents having to carry him to bed. Uh, stories of trips to go fishing that really were little more than going to the cabin and, and drinking with friends. You, you know, always there are always people around Roosevelt. He was also known to add a few drops, perhaps, of absinthe for flavor, according to his personal secretary, Grace Tully. The Pernod absinthe bottle would be uh, ever-present at the tray of liquor at the White House. Tully also indicates that the type of martini that uh, Roosevelt likes is three parts gin to one part vermouth. But we've heard that's, that's one story. Uh, there are differing stories that it could be as much as two part gin to one point vermouth. In other words, you're reducing the amount of gin, increasing the amount of vermouth. Vermouth is an Italian wine that is spiced, um, but it is weaker than the gin that is used and would would be used commonly in a martini. The martini is very popular around the time that Roosevelt would have been a budding politician, which would have involved a lot of social events and drinking, the teens, the 20s, and certainly going into prohibition. Um, Gin was easier to produce. You were allowed to produce a certain amount of alcohol, you know, the so-called bathtub gin, per the Volstead Act. So it wasn't completely illegal to produce it for your own consumption, and there was a lot of gin available for this reason. So the martini drink became quite popular during this period. The history of the martini is one of those things where there's a lot of legends about it and different um, stories about this bartender or that. 
invented it. So there's no story that really has precedence, but it seems pretty logical. I mean, the Manhattan, which also involves vermouth, but using rye instead, was definitely around right in the period after the Civil War, the 1870s, started to be made. So the martini seems a, a variant of this, and it also just seems like a common phrase. Because the main maker of vermouth was Martini and Ross, uh, it was very common for people to say, give me a gin and martini. And then if you're doing that over the years, eventually the drink, you know, would just drop and it will become, give me a martini. But through the aughts, the teens and the 20s, this is the big drink and Roosevelt picks that right up. Hello everyone, it's Takuya here. And I'm Gabby. And we are the hosts of History of Everything, a podcast which you can probably guess by the name is, well, I mean, it's about everything. Do you want to know why people thought potatoes were evil and would give you syphilis? Are you curious about all the stories of the terrible and stupid ways that people have kicked the bucket over the years? Do you want to hear tales about all of the different badasses of history and the lives that they had brought to life? Well, if so, then look no further. History of Everything is just the right podcast for you. It's available on Spotify, Pandora, and anywhere else that you get your podcast from. Join us for some fun and just see how weird and wacky history can be. If you enjoy bizarre true stories, then the Useless Information Podcast is the podcast for you. For example, did you know that author Robert Louis Stevenson gave his birthday away? Or that there was a football team that played for six years before someone realized that the school never, ever existed. Or that a dog in upstate New York was once placed on trial for murder. Well, to hear these and hundreds of additional fascinating true stories from the flip side history, be sure to check out the Useless Information Podcast. That's the Useless Information Podcast, podcasting worldwide since 2008 and available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening right now. Be sure to check it out. What's something you learned in history class that you feel wasn't the whole truth? Better yet, what's something you didn't learn at all that was omitted completely? That's what I like to call redacted history. I believe that all history, no matter how good or bad, needs to be told. There are wars, massacres, battles, and entire historical events that are just not in our school's history books. Have you ever heard of Mary Bowser? I didn't think so. My name is Andre White, the host of the Redacted History Podcast, the place where history's forgotten events, heroes, and villains get their story told, one episode at a time. So come huddle around the campfire with me and get ready to hear the stories that you were robbed of. And get comfortable. We're going to be here a while. The Redacted History Podcast. Real history never dies. Stream the Redacted History Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. In case you want to make it at home, this is the recipe for the Valkyl Cookbook um, for the FDR special. Two parts gin, one part dry light vermouth, olive or lemon peel for garnish, crushed ice. Shake up gin and vermouth in a container half filled with chipped ice. Pour into chilled martini glasses, straining out the ice. Add garnish. There's one element that's missing from there, and that is that apparently Roosevelt and many of his martinis liked a lot of olive brine. And that the lemon peel would be used only to rub around the cocktail glasses, not to put in the martini. His kinfolk would pressure him into using different gin vermouth ratios. Jimmy Roosevelt suggested three to one. Elliot pushed for four to one. Johnny Roosevelt asked for stout six to one, a pretty strong martini, but the kind of martinis that are generally served today, although more commonly now with vodka. He'd throw a little gin at the end, his grandson Curtis say. He'd thrown a little absinthe. Many people, and this is recorded, his grandson Curtis say, say, I said, 
say, the president made the worst martinis I've ever tasted. Eleanor was not joining Roosevelt in these libations. Uh, her family had a severe problem. Her, she grew up with two uncles that were such lushes that uh, people were not involved, invited to the house. She was also extremely concerned about drinking and driving. FDR not so. He told his teenagers that a gentleman learns his capacity and tries not to exceed it. If he must drink to excess, he does so when he has no call to be in touch with anyone else. <laughs> As president, though, there weren't too many moments where you wouldn't have called to be in touch with anyone else. So <laughs> there seemed to be a presidential exception from that rule. FDR and uh, FDR's martinis were his favorite. He was also a fan of the old fashioned. And this is the drink that if you were a fan of Mad Men, that's the Don Draper's drink. You'll see that it has uh, bourbon and perhaps a cherry and a lemon or orange peel. Franklin Roosevelt's drink menu, not surprisingly, is coming more from the 1890s and the aughts, um, 1880s, 1890s, aughts, martinis, old-fashioned. The old-fashioned is something that was old-fashioned when they called it an old-fashioned. The name derives from the fact that it used to just simply be called a whiskey cocktail. So rather than just having the whiskey neat or straight, you would have something added to it, usually sugar cubes or fruit, in order to sweeten it up a bit. A whiskey cocktail, and then as the and that that kind of a drink would have been available in the eighteen thirties or uh, running up to the Civil War in a pub or a bar. As you got to the eighteen eighties and the eighteen nineties, and that drink was available. Particularly, it became. It had a little bit of a resurgence in the 1880s in coming out of Louisville and then the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York. And so since it was reminiscent of those old whiskey cocktails, it was called the Old Fashioned, since there was a sugar cube and bitters added instead of just drinking the whiskey plain. Oh, I think in addition to just telling an interesting story to give you a little perspective on the real Franklin Roosevelt in that episode on the Truman VP choice, I suppose is a little bit of a metaphor for a president that was relentlessly experimenting with different types of legislation and economic ideas, relentlessly experimenting with new staff and who would be his VP or unofficial assistant president um, man manipulating and working the various political factions so that everyone was at least working for the party, the country, and him. Now, in case we're thinking this is just uh, ancillary activities, extracurricular activities on the part of President Roosevelt, it did have somewhat of a democratic, a diplomatic purpose. Um, if you look at the two partners that Roosevelt was dealing with in World War II, Churchill and Stalin, we were talking about big drinkers. Elliot Roosevelt in later years remembered his father telling him about the Tehran Conference and the 365 toasts, one for every day in the year during the famous conference. When British Prime Minister Winston Churchill visited the White House, for two or three weeks at a time during World War II, there would be all-nighters accompanied by sniffers of brandy and hefty cigars. The president would engage him and would do what the White House staffers called keeping Winston hours. Afterward, FDR would sleep at 10 hours a night or three days in a row to recuperate. It's kind of like I could one could imagine... I would like to see you, Mr. President. <laughs> Not this week. But in this case, uh, it, it helped him. During the Tehran conference with Stalin, uh, Roosevelt suggested martinis, and Stalin actually preferred uh, either Russian vodka or uh, champagne. And 
about martinis, Stalin said, it's cold on the stomach. Nikita Khrushchev later would even provide more details about how, at least, Soviets at that time felt about the American martini. It was America's secret weapon, he said. <laughs> 